It's good to come together and pray, man. It's, prayer is a powerful thing. And so we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5, and I'll tell you we're going to go through two verses. Okay, two verses, and honestly, I think I wanted to go through 21 verses at first. And I mean, sometimes you can do it, sometimes you just got to know your limits. And today is one of those days where I'm like, you know what, this is enough. And we need to really understand and get it. And so Ephesians 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Be imitators of God as beloved children. But there's one interesting word to note. And this is like a little Bible study trick, pastor. It's even like a joke, but it's not really a joke. But when you see a therefore, you got to find out what it's Therefore, ho, 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 it's hilarious, right? It's like a pastor joke, but it's really actually pretty serious. Whenever you see a therefore, you really do want to understand what it's there for. Why does he say that? Well, when we ask that question, well, what is he saying? Therefore, be imitators of God. Well, what has Paul been telling us this entire time? Right? What has Paul, the church planter of the church at Ephesus, been telling this church that he planted, these people that he loves? What has he been telling them? Well, he's been telling them and he's been telling us who we are in Christ. You're loved, you're chosen, you're blessed, you're adopted in, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, you're forgiven and redeemed. And then he goes on, and I love this part, he says, tells us who we were in the world before Christ, right? Remember that in Ephesians chapter 2? He says who we are in Christ, he starts off with the good stuff, but then he reminds you, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And then he goes on into chapter 3, and he says who we are as the church, That God didn't just save you to make you saved and get you this get out of hell free card. It's like he saved you. He's gifted you so that you can be part of something bigger than yourself. And that being the church, this mystery that's revealed. And then as we've seen in the last couple weeks, Paul tells us because of those things, walk in a manner worthy. Uh, He tells us how we should walk. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling in which we were called, in a manner that shows that we recognize Jesus came and died for us, in a way that would represent that to the world. Why are you different? Why do you love? Why do you forgive? Why do you seek to help and to serve people for really no other reason than to help and serve them? Well, we would say, because Jesus died and served my greatest need. And so when we walk in a manner worthy of the calling, it should show people, the world, our friends, our family, that we recognize that Jesus has given a high price for our salvation. And so then Paul continues his thoughts, right? And here he's like, since all of these things are true, who you are in Christ, who you used to be, who you are in, as part of the church, how you should walk then. Since, and so because of all that's true, God being rich in mercy bringing us together as a type of new creation. It's like, then act like it. Walk like it. Don't just talk about it. Help me if you know the next. Be about it, right? So that's going to be my message title today, too. I thought I was going to call it Wake Up because I was going to go through verses 21 and say, we got to wake up, and we'll get to that next week. So spoiler alert for that, but you can read ahead. But like today, it's like, don't talk about it, be about it. Don't just talk about it, be about it. Therefore, because of all those things, because they're true, because you're saved, because Jesus loves you so much, because God is rich in mercy, and while we were still sinners, He saved us, therefore be imitators of God. The word imitator isn't hard to understand, is it? Right? You know what that means. It means to mimic, to, to follow after, to try to be like, and, or in the sense like, what he's saying is be like God. Now we need to know that we are not God and we can never be God. All right. Because we know that Satan, Lucifer, that was his sin. He thought that me, I I could elevate myself to the point of being God or maybe even be better than God. Now we got to understand that's sinful. That's prideful. That's not what we're talking about when he says be imitators of God. We saying be like God. But what we can say very clearly is that scripture is calling us to be like God is any, any objections? Like, be imitators of God. Be like God. Now, when we think about that, like, we understand it to a degree. Okay, be like God. Imitate God. Do what He does. Follow after Him. But when we actually think about it, let it sit in. That's kind of a weighty task, isn't it? It's kind of like, ah, I get it. But you, you Paul, you don't get it. It's like, yeah, I'd love to, but man, that's hard. 21 days of praying and fasting. Like, I, I barely made it through that. Maybe we didn't make it through it. And then we look at Jesus, who was God in the flesh, and he went 40 days, and we're like, man, be like God? 
go 40 days? Man, I don't know if I can do it. It's a weighty task. How can we be called to do such a thing? It's saying, be like God. Or I, I remember a movie, maybe some of you guys remember this, this movie called Be Like Mike or something like that, right? Is that what it's called? Like Mike, right, with Lil Bow Wow. Um, back in the day, I know, it's ridiculous. It's sad. I, I never watched it. I wasn't in it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I was into Lil Bow Wow for a moment. Um, but be like Mike, and I mean, if we want to, like, make a better thing, it's like be like Michael Jordan is kind of the idea of that, right, that movie in a sense, right? But it'd be like me saying, hey, be like Michael Jordan. And, like, we're like, okay, like, we can pretend right? We'll jump as high as we can. I'll go dribble the ball as fancy as I can, which isn't very fancy or good or cool um, and not very, very effective. And I can jump and do the famous classic Michael Jordan, Air Jordan pose, you know, legs spread out, tongue sticking out, going for the rim. But at the end of the day, I think all of us can agree that we cannot be like Michael Jordan, right? It's just not going to happen. Or Tom Brady for another great for you guys, right? Um, I would say Aaron Rodgers, but, you know, I'm sorry. For that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. I had to do a little something. We, we could talk about everybody's team, except for Tom Brady. I mean, he's still in there, but whatever. But he's calling us to do something that's impossible. And you're like, Paul, man, this is, this is a little ridiculous. I get it, but it, how am I going to do it? It's impossible. But I believe that that's part of the point is that he's calling us to something that you and I cannot do on our own. We, we can't do if left to ourselves by ourselves. but the good news is God, Jesus, doesn't leave us alone. He doesn't leave us to ourselves to say, hey, be like me and try your hardest to be, be good and to be forgiving. He's like, he doesn't leave us alone. He's like, I'll be there with you. He says, go make disciples and behold, I'll be with you till the end of the age. He doesn't leave us on our own. And what does, in fact, Jesus say about impossible things? If you remember some of his stuff, right? The disciples are talking about, and Jesus is talking about rich men and rich people. And he's like, man, it's hard for a rich man to enter heaven. You guys remember that? And then uh, he says, in fact, like, it's impossible for a rich man to enter heaven. And then the disciples are like, well, then, Jesus, who can be saved? Right? Like, who can be saved then? And then Jesus says these great awesome word. He says, with man, it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Isn't that encouraging? Because we're like, man, be like God, imitate God. How can I do that? Well, you can't on your own, but with God, with the Holy Spirit, all things are possible. And so he says, be imitators of God. And let me just point out, it doesn't sound like a suggestion, does it? Hey, since you're a Christian, since you're part of the church, since you came here to Fervent Church today, or for Paul, to the church at Ephesus today, if you feel so inclined, maybe live like God, if you feel like it, right? It doesn't sound like that. Be imitators of God. It's a command. Be imitators of God because of who you are, because of what Christ has done. Be imitators of God. Remember last week, if you remember chapter 4, Paul says, don't walk like the Gentiles do. And what he was saying is, don't live like you used to live. You can't do it anymore. If you're a Christian, if you're following Jesus, you can't hold on to the old lifestyle. you got to let it go, and you got to say, that, those are things of the past. Did it happen? Yeah, sure, it happened. Those are things that I did. That's stuff that defined me, but not anymore. That's not who I am anymore. God's calling us, you and I, anyone watching on Facebook or listening to this later, calling us out of the world to be different. We're not to live or act or imitate the world anymore, but we're to live like Christians, to act like Christians and to imitate God. Second Corinthians six seventeen. this one won't be on the screen unless Caleb's really fast, but uh, 2 Corinthians six seventeen essentially says, be ye separate, like come out from the world and be separate. You don't need to put it on the screen, Caleb, it's all right. Thank you for your, your eyes. <laughs> yeah, um, he says, be separate from them. Be, be set apart from the world. That's what God's saying. Be separate. Be set apart. Now, those words like be separate or be set apart, I think it's interesting because on one hand, there it is, therefore go out from their midst. That's the world and be separate from them. You can't be part of the world anymore. I'm sorry to break the news to you, but you can't go on living your worldly ways and say that I'm a Christian who's saved and I got the Holy Spirit and I'm imitating God, yet there's nothing changed about you. No, like he's calling you to be something different. And I think the word separate, or we could say set apart, it's interesting. On the one hand, 
We need to know God has set us apart, right? In Ephesians 1, we saw all the stuff. You're, you're blessed, you're chosen, you're adopted. Those are things God did. And, and if you've accepted him, like he has set you apart in that sense. We're set apart. But think about the word set apart. Like literally just think about it being, being set apart. Do you ever, do you guys ever hear that word, that phrase kind of used in your day to day or week to week? I don't know. For me, some of you know, like I love CrossFit, I love fitness, and so I would say I love sports, but I don't really, like some of you guys know, I don't watch football or basketball or baseball. Like the only sport I really follow is CrossFit. Make fun of me, doesn't matter, okay? Like I follow all the coaches, athletes on Instagram, listen to podcasts all the time about health and fitness and all this stuff. And now they'll talk from time to time, like what sets these athletes apart from the rest? What sets these athletes apart from just an average Joe person? Now it's not that the coach on first day, day one, Rich Froning or Matt Frazier comes in and say, I'm their coach, which would be a, an amazing honor. And no, so Matt Frazier, if you're watching, you need coaching, just come on down. Um, no, but if they came in, these guys, some of you don't even know, they're the guys who won the, CrossFit Games, fittest man on earth, like multiple times. And so anyways, if they came in day one, like, hey, Nick, I want you to coach me. And then I'm just like, hey, Matt Frazier, like you don't have any training. You haven't done this very long, but you are set apart. Now, for me just saying that, that's not going to make any change in him physically, right? It's like to be set apart is, as an athlete is to pursue being an athlete like if you're the greatest football player baseball whatever you put in your own reference right to be that great fill in the blank you must pursue filling in the blank right and so so for god he calls us to be set apart and yes we are set apart because he's chosen us and adopted us and he's brought us in as part of his church but at the same time set apart is something that we need to pursue it's like you will be set apart when you pursue and imitate God, right? Isn't there just that sense of being set apart where it's not something that just happens, something to be pursued? So be separate, be set apart, be imitators of God. And so to be something is to pursue something. And so if we want to be like God, what do you guys think? We got to pursue God. We got to pursue God. You can't be a Christian, live like the world. I already told you guys that, but we got to be changed. Now, be imitators of God. Going back to Ephesians 5 1, be imitators of God. That brings us to a question. I mean, it should, anyways, be imitators of God. And I know for some of us, we have some Bible knowledge. We have a relationship with the Lord. We've been walking with Him for a while. We know a little bit about the Bible, but I mean, at first glance, if we were to tell someone, who's a new believer, hey, be imitators of God. Well, the question, what is God like? What, is, what does that mean? Who is, who is God? What are all these things? We know from Scripture that, hey, Jesus is, the, is God in the flesh. We know there's the Father God. We know there's Holy Spirit, right? Yahweh is God. But what is He like? And I, and I wanted to open this up for a second if you guys have any thoughts on it. Like, who, who is God? Like, if you have any scriptures that might come to mind, just like off the top, if, if you want to share, you don't have to. And I have one that I'm going to share. Um, but any thoughts? Like, who is God? What is he like? Any... Uh, uh, Exodus 6, 4. Do you, his, uh, his attributes. Do you know them off the top of your head? Or some of them? One of them? Uh, loving kindness, long-suffering... Oh, check it out. Caleb, on point. Uh, maybe it's 4 6 then. <laughs> Little dick six. Hey, it's all good. But what'd you say? You said that he's uh, long suffering, loving, loving kindness. Any other thoughts on who God is, scriptures? I like Ephesians 4 2. Ephesians 4 2. Maybe it's 4 <laughs> Yeah, and those are attributes of God, characteristics of God, or following in His likeness. God is holy. God is holy. I think about when Jesus said, like, if, like, uh, what does He say? Um, Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And we're like, that's a hard task, but that He's perfect. He's holy, and holy. He's set apart. Any other thoughts? Yeah, Yahweh, Jehovah, Jireh, our God provider. 
Anything, any other thoughts? You don't have to. Is, I don't mean, to, God is love. There we go. First John something. God is love. That's it's great. But check, check this out. And this is not a all encompassing, all encompassing list, but Psalm 103, if you want to turn there, feel free, or we'll have it on the screen here. Psalm 103 verse one says, bless the Lord. O my soul and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And I just want you to understand this, like forget not all his benefits. And now what David, the, the writer of this psalm, is going to get into is some of his benefits, who the Lord is. And check it out. He says, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your worth is or your youth is renewed like the eagles the lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed he made known his ways to moses his acts to the people of israel the lord is merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love he will not always chide nor will he keep his anger forever he does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. It's, a, it's a, not a, an exhaustive list, but that gives you a pretty good understanding, a little bit of who God is. Well, who is God? Be imitators of God. Well, what does that mean, Paul? We look at that one psalm. That's just one chapter, not even the whole chapter out of the Bible where you can get characteristics of God. Well, how should I live? Well, you should probably read the Bible, but, right? But he's, he forgives. God forgives. He's a forgiving God. Jesus says, if you want your heavenly Father to forgive you, you must forgive others. We're imitators of God. God heals. He, he heals miracul miraculously, but how could we do that? Well, there's a gift of healing for sure. I've seen it happen before. I've told some of you the story where like, I, I went and prayed with this guy in the ICU, and I didn't know him much, but Pastor Ray, if you're from Calvary Tucson, he came alongside. It was my first hospital visit, so I'm terrified, right? I'm like, what do I do? How do I do this? I don't know. Like, I know how to pray, but this is scary. And Ray came, and we anointed this dude with oil, and they said he had a 10% chance of, of living. And if he did live, that he was going to be in some type of, of coma-like state or something like that. And then we prayed for this guy. I mean, I believe it was probably Pastor Ray who had the gift of healing because I probably had the gift of doubting at that point where I'm like, I don't know. I know I believe God, but help my unbelief. And we pray for this guy. And about three months later, we're at the West Campus and believe it, like, believe it or not, this dude comes walking in. He was in a motorcycle crash. Like he couldn't walk or anything. And so they're like, he's not going to walk again. That's for sure. Um, has a 10% chance of even living. And this guy comes walking in totally normal. Of course, he has some scarring and all that stuff, but like, he, he was all there mentally. He was all there physically. And it was pretty amazing. And he was like, I just want to thank you guys for praying for me because God healed me. God is a healer. And he wants to use us to heal people, to help people in their sickness. And I mean, what better time in history really than to help people in their sickness than right now as people are getting sick left and right. God redeems is one of the things we saw there. He redeems the sinful broken person, right? He takes the outcast and he gives them purpose to live. It's like, that's what God does. He's in the business of doing that. We were the outcasts. God said, I love you. Come here. I got a plan. I got a purpose for you. He redeems. He shows steadfast love and mercy. God satisfies. I love that part in Psalm 103. He satisfies everything that we need. Jesus says that if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all the other things will be added to you. He'll, he'll take care of the things. He'll satisfy your physical needs as you seek him for your spiritual needs. God satisfies. God is a righteous and just God. And I love that because, man, today, just if you watch the news, if you've been alive and even on Instagram or TikTok, things like that. In this last few years, it's like, man, we got the justice warriors out there. And hey, I'm all about justice. I love it. It's good. God is just. You could say you're imitating God, but God is truly just. God is truly righteous. Not just what you think or feel is right. Well, it feels right, so I'm going to do it. 
well, it feels just, so I'm going to be about it. No, God is righteous and just in the most purest, full sense. And then it says God is merciful. He's gracious, right? He gives us things that we don't deserve. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in steadfast love. God is compassionate. And I love that he says God knows us. He, he knows us. So when he's like, man, be like God, be like Yahweh, our, our God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. This is who we're called to imitate. Those are just some of the ways, the, some of the characteristics of his, his being. Those are the ways that we're called to live. And so he says, therefore, be imitators of God. If you go back to Ephesians 5, 1, therefore, be imitators of God. And I love this part as beloved children, because you are his children. You're his kids. And you know what kids do? Some of us have kids. Some of us, maybe you want kids. What do kids do? Like they imitate their parents, right? I remember a day like when Lucas was probably two, maybe, and I'm shaving, right? And like I just got my shaving cream on. Daddy, what's that? I want some of that, right? And I squirt some in his hand and he puts it, he's running around the house with shaving cream on his face. He just wants to be like, Daddy, he doesn't know what we're doing or why we're doing it. And like, he doesn't have facial hair, obviously, right? He just wants to be like me. Right, I remember Nola, and she even does this today. She'll put on Amber's shoes, and, and she doesn't have heels, but like you know, puts on her Vans, and they're just way too big, and she's just clacking down the, the hallway. Right, so she wants to be like mommy. Kids just want to be like their parents, and so he's like, "You're, you're God's kids, and, and you should want to act like God." Now the thing is, like, if we don't know God, then how are we going to do that? But once we start to understand His love for us and His devotion, it should be one of those things where man. I want to know you more, God. I want to forgive, not because your word says I have to forgive, but because you've forgiven me. Because you're my heavenly father and, and you love me like that. And now I want to forgive. I, I want to go out and I want to help people. Not because, oh, I got to help people and be hospitable. Um, because Romans chapter 12 says that I need to do that. No, I want to be that way because, man, God, you've, you're so good to me. Right? Right? It's like that's how we should imitate God as a kid who loves their heavenly father, that we just love him so much that we just want to do what he does. We want to be where he is. We want to be like him, man. Isn't, aren't your kids like that sometimes? I know for me, when I go to work, it's like, Daddy, why you got to go to work today? It's like, well, if you want to have a Capri Sun to drink tomorrow, I need to go make some money today, right? They don't understand that, but they just, they want you to be home. They want you to be around, or even if you're going to work, they want to go to work with you. Why can't I come too? I don't want to go to school. I want to go. I'll go work with you, Daddy. Yeah, right. <laughs> no. um, one day. Um, but like those are just, those are obviously like cute examples. But man, that's how we should love our Father. That's how we should love and see God. We we do these things because we see Him doing that to us and showing us. And so, our, uh, be imitators of God as as children, love children. And the more we truly know God, the more I believe we'll want to be like Him. The clearer we see Him, the, the clearer, more we understand Him and His Word, the more we'll want to actually live it out. And now a little side note tangent on that is like as a reminder of parents or parents who, people who want to be parents one day, it's like it should kind of remind us or maybe even rebuke us or encourage us at the very least right our kids look up to us whether we're a good parent or a bad parent or somewhere in between we are the example they're learning who we are they're learning how to live by what we do by how we treat them how we treat others how we talk they see that they start to talk that way right how we walk they will learn to be like you because they love you whether you're good or bad Right. And that's just that. I don't know. I, I know that's not where Paul's going with this, but I just thought I, it's definitely worth mentioning as we are imitators of God. We should be imitators of God, not only for ourselves, but for our kids so they can see, man, my dad just he loves to serve. Right. And I want to serve. I want to be like him. And so he goes on the second verse for today. And the last verse that we'll cover in Ephesians is the, kind of more of the answer of how we'll do that be imitators of god as beloved children how will we do that well he says walk in love 
walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So he says, walk in love as Christ loved us. In 1 John, it says that we love God not because we, we first loved him, but we love him because he first loved us. Our love is a response to God's love. And so what he's saying, though, is walk in love. And I love that he uses that walking. Obviously, it's an action word, right? It's like it means what it means. It's like you could look up the Greek. It's like, yeah, it means to physically walk, but then it has this implication of action. That's really what this word is, this action Walk it out, live it out, walk in love. Now this word love, many of you know it is the word agape, right? You guys familiar with that word? There's a few different words for love in the Greek and agape is like the highest form. It's the God love. It's the, the love that like nothing else compares. And it's this unconditional love. Unconditional love, I think of a couple ways that we could illustrate it. I think of back in the day, for me, my BC days before Christ, there's like the, the homie bro love, like I got your back. It doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. If you started the fight or they started the fight, it doesn't matter if it's three in the morning and you call me, I'll be there and I'm going to bring everybody else because we're in it together, right? I don't know if you guys had those kind of people. Probably not. And if you don't, good. Um, But like I I had some interesting friends. I was interesting, if you will. But it's like there's that unconditional love. doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. I got your back. You're my bro and I'm going to be there for you. Another way that's probably even better and, um, and we'll actually get into this in the week's probably in a week or two, there's the husband and wife love, right? That's a way that we can understand. And when you take your vows, pretty much every single wedding, whether it's Christian or not, takes these vows says for better or for worse, for richer or poor, sickness and in health till death do us part. Ride together, die together, whatever happens, it happens. We're in this together. That's that unconditional love where it's like it doesn't matter what happens, what matters is that I'm, I'm committed, we're, we're committed into this. And that's the type of love that Paul's saying here. It's like it's this committed love, not a feeling type of love. So don't get it m- mixed up or messed up. This world today, it's all about love. And we got to use it in air quotes because it's definitely not agape love that they're talking about. It's not any of the type of Bible love. It's more of an infatuation type love. What does that mean? It's like, well, infatuated, like it's just this passion, this desire within you where it's like, oh, like I just love being around you because you make me feel good and you, you make me feel important. And, and it's all about how you make me feel. So therefore, I love you. That's not the love that he's talking about here. This love has nothing to do with how you feel. It has all, everything to do with I want to do it because I'm committed. Right. And so this is the way that. God is calling us to to walk, walk in love, committed love, whether you feel it or not, not to gain for yourself, not for profit, not to make yourself look better, but simply because we, as we imitate God, as we know God, we see his love for us where we're like, I don't deserve any of this and I'm going to imitate it. I'm going to live like this to the world because of how God has loved me. It's a response. Our love should lead others to really like when we look at God's love, doesn't it just make you think sometimes, like, why, God? Like, why me? Like, seriously, I got all my struggles, all my baggage, and you would choose me to do anything at all? That's pretty crazy, in my opinion. It's not a smart business move, God. But God's like, no, I love you anyways, right? Despite our sins, despite our iniquities, it's like he, he's calling us, and then our things, why would you do that for me? And hopefully that would be the question people would ask when you show them love, where you're just committed to them. They're in the wrong. They blew it. They messed up, yet you love them anyways. They'd say, why would you do that for me? When well, we'd say, because God did that for me. And we're walking in his footsteps. It's said of the Apostle John, or the disciple John, right, who wrote the book of John and 1st and 2nd and 3rd John and Revelation. It's said, this is not in Scripture, this is kind of more of like religious tradition and what they kind of passed on. But after the island of Patmos, which is where he wrote the book of Revelation, if you know church tradition, it says that he was boiled in oil. Um, He was the only um, original disciple who wasn't killed. Like they definitely tried to kill him, right? Boiling him in oil. But it's said that after the island of Patmos that he made his way back to the church at Ephesus. Now, I don't know if this is true or not. This is just kind of what they say. And so he made his way back to the church at Ephesus. And that's where he lived for pretty much the rest of his life, however long that might have been. He was an old man. He was beaten up and he'd seen a lot and he's been through a lot. So he made his way back and he wouldn't teach 
because uh, he's an old man, but he would go there and he would sit and listen. And it was said that the, the people would kind of bring him in on his bed. And I get that picture of like when Jesus is preaching and then the friends lower his, their friend down on the bed um, in the middle of service through the roof. And it's like, I just picture like they're kind of bringing John in on his bed. He's an old man. He can't get around much. And they would put him there and he would just sit and listen. And then every once in a while, and probably not every once in a while, probably every day or every Sunday John was there, they'd probably be like, John, like, tell us something, dude. Like, you've seen a lot, man. Like, give us, give us your best, right? Wouldn't you guys be that way? Like, if you saw John, he's, he's the beloved one of Christ, like, and you just be like, John, just come on, man. Tell me something that I don't know. Tell me something that's going to change and rock my world, and tell me something, man. And it's said that every time people would ask him, he would say this, dear children, love one another. Dear children, love one another, right? They come back the next week and they, hey, John, uh, can you tell us something? He'd say, dear children, love one another. And then they'd say, John, can, can you tell us something other than dear children, love one another? And you know what he said? Dear children, love one another. Now, it's said that an elder came over to, to him one day and he's like, John, I mean, I don't know. This is, again, this is me like bringing it to life in my head. John, I'm, it's good stuff, right? Like you're telling them all to love one another. But like, why is that the only thing that you ever say? It said that the elder asked him that. And he said, because if you've done that, you've done everything. If, if you love one another, you've done it all. And that's what Jesus said. He said, love God, the Lord your God, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you've loved your brother as yourself, if you've loved one another, you've done it all. Now, I don't, again, I don't know if that story is true, but definitely the principle of it is and that Jesus again said, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. So we're to be imitators of God and we're to walk in love. We're to practice, have this action of we're committed for better or worse, right? For richer or poorer, we're in it, Lord, and we're going to love you and we're going to love others no matter what comes. And when we came out to plant this church, that's one of the things that I said of values like for better or worse, we're committed. It's like a marriage, like we're going for it, Lord. Whatever happens, I'm going to be okay with. I'm all in, all in, all for you. So Jesus says, love one another. Again, Paul says, walk in love. And he says, as Christ loved us. Again, First John says that we love God because he first loved us. You got to understand, God doesn't love you because you love him. Like, oh, I've earned his love towards me. No, he loves you. God is love, as Sam said. And that's in First John too. Uh, God is love. Our response is our love in response to God's love. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. And now this is where I want to start wrapping things up a bit. And, and um, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, and he says, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. What I want to note is like he was not just a fragrant offering among many. He was not just a sacrifice among many. He was the sacrifice. And you need to know that. This is everything here, right? We're going to be getting into Hebrews, and you guys know this, but Hebrews is a great, complex book, but really, if we're going to boil it down, Hebrews is all about Jesus. It's just putting Jesus on the throne where he, where he should be, and it's saying that everything else pales in comparison. And, and Check it out, though, if we got it, Hebrews 10. This is going to be a little bit of a, a read, but bear with me. Or if you want to turn in your Bibles, if it's easier. But Hebrews 10, verse 1, says, For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. And so whoever's writing Hebrews, right? Some people think that it's Paul. Some people think that it's, you know, there's all kinds of thoughts of who it might be. But they're saying like the law it can't, can't save people and the sacrifices they're making is not going to perfect those who draw near. And then he goes on, he says, otherwise, would they, uh, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer uh, have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices... There's a reminder. 
That's what the sacrifices in the temple and all these um, laws of sacrifice were for, a reminder of our sin. He says there's a reminder of sins every year. And then check this out. This is important if you have your physical Bible highlight. It says, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Isn't that interesting? It's like, so for hundreds and even thousands of years, the Jewish people are giving sacrifices, right? It's like, they're thinking that they're cleansed. It's not, they're not actually being cleansed. It's just something that's kind of covering it. It's a picture of what Jesus is going to do. And it's a reminder of Jesus' ultimate sacrifice. And he goes on, it says, Consequently, when Christ came into the world, that is Jesus, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you've taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. See, Jesus is saying, "I, I know who I am. I know why I came here. I came here to do the will of God and to take away the sins of the world. And he goes on, he says, When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And there's a few, a little bit more. Read with me. It says, And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin, sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. When he sat down, it means the work's finished. It's done. And that's what Jesus said on the cross. It is finished. And he says he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, that being Jesus and his body, his life being laid down, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Jesus is our offering. He he is the offering that actually cleanses us from sins. He is the offering that makes uh, makes peace between us and God and us and the law, where the law doesn't really matter anymore because we're like, Jesus fulfilled the law, and now we become his righteousness, and Jesus became our sins. Right? He became a man, but he was God. He humbled himself. He lived a perfect life. We know that. We can read that through Scripture. Jesus, in his life on earth, he was modeling the way. You want to be an imitator of God? You want to be an imitator of me? Well, look at what I do. Look at how I live. Jesus was a compassionate dude. He always made time for everybody, it seems. It's like there was never an interruption, right, when the disciples say, man, Jesus, send them away so they can get food somewhere else. Jesus says, you give them something to eat. Right? Well, we got two loaves and five fish. It's like, what is this to so many? And then Jesus says, bring it here. Let me see it. Right. It's like, it's not an inconvenience that the people are there to him. He's like, I want to serve everybody for us. Like how much is it an inconvenience when something happens in our life? Man, I got to do that. I got to help them in that way or whatever, man, if we're going to imitate God, we got to be like, whatever it is, whatever it takes, love, agape, unconditional. I'm in it. Whatever, whatever you want, Lord, Jesus was all in it. He was about it. We should be about it. And so he lived the life. He modeled how we should live. Then, you know, he was arrested. He was beaten as an innocent man. He was beaten as God because he is God. He's beaten by his creation. I think that's crazy, right? It's like the people you created are killing you. How jacked up is that? He's hung on a cross. Scripture says again that Jesus became sin so that we might become his righteousness. It's literally swapping places. Jesus is like, I'll take the beating. I'll take the death. I'll take all of your sin upon myself because I love you so much. Right. Do you you got to know Jesus knew what was ahead. It's not like he went to the cross and thought, well, this will be easy. Not, it, well, it's not that bad. Yeah, I've seen crucifixion. It seems bad, but it's not going to be that bad. No, he knew what he was getting into. And Hebrews says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. The joy, that's you and me. I'm setting these people free. And so he goes to the cross, right? And he's, he's being mocked on the cross. He's being laughed at, scorned, rejected, all the things. And as he was on the cross, he said a, a handful of things, a couple that I want to note. He says, Father, forgive them. 
He's looking at the people, making fun of them, maybe laughing at them, maybe throwing things at them, all the things, right? He says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. Talk about love. I'm, I'm, he's dying for them. And in that very moment, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know, and they don't know what I'm doing. I'm buying their sins right here, literally, right? And he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And so he dies, he's being killed and crucified, and he's still preaching and praying for forgiveness for these people. And then as he breathed his last, Jesus said, It is finished. It's the word to tell us die. I don't know if that's how you say it, but it is finished. The work, the offering, the atonement for sin, the sacrifice had been made. That, it was, that was the mark in history where it's like, you don't need to come to the altar to the, the high priest or the priest anymore with your, with your spiritual things and your acts of worship. No, you just need to come to Jesus. It's finished. It's fulfilled in Jesus. And as scripture said, once for all. And that anyone who would turn and believe in him would have everlasting life. Jesus' work on the cross bought our salvation. Jesus bought our forgiveness. And we're forgiven and we're free to live and we're free to be imitators of God because of what Jesus did. And he's calling us into a life of following after him. We know in, in Luke 9, it's one of many times Jesus says this in the different gospel accounts, but he says, he says whoever would follow me, you must pick up your cross. You've got to deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow after me. What he's saying is like, you've got to die to yourself. That old Gentile way of living, that old sinful, selfish way of living, you've got to put that away. You've got to pick up your cross. It's going to be hard. You're going to be, get laughed at. People are going to hate you because they hated me. And you've got to follow me. Imitate me. Come after me. And he's calling us into this new life, this new relationship with him. And you got to know it's not just a better way. It is the way, the only way, the only way to live, the only way to truly be fulfilled. As Psalm 103 says, like he, he satisfies us. The only way to be satisfied truly, man, is in knowing God and living for him. So when we consider these, these things and we say that we believe, we got to, Come back to the message title that I said. Like, don't just talk about it. Be about it. It's easy to say, what it, say things, right? We can say whatever we want all day, any day, right? Especially like coming out to Texas, nobody knows you. I could say whatever I want. I'm, I'm an elite CrossFit athlete for all you know. I got a rogue shirt on. Not today, but like I do a lot of times. Like they'd be like, well, you don't look like it, but maybe you are, right? I could say those things, but it's like, don't talk about it, be about it. Because then when they see me in the gym, they're like, you are not an elite athlete, my friend. And I'd be like, no, I lied to you. But uh, don't talk about it, be about it. Don't just say I'm a Christian, I go to church. Like live this stuff out in your day-to-day -day lives. Not just on Sundays when we come together, but tomorrow. When we go home, how do you treat your kids? How do you model God to your kids through the way that you, you talk and act? How do you model God at work, right? And you got to understand, like, everyone's not going to just come to Jesus because you are an imitator of God. And even if you do it well and the Holy Spirit's just alive and active and just really just um, pouring out through you, right? It's like people are just going to think, you're weird. You're crazy. I don't get it. And that's how the world's going to be. Because living for God is the complete opposite of living for the world. It's a selfless abandonment where I'm like, hey, I'm giving myself like Jesus gave himself up for the sake of others so that they may know him. Now, my last text that I want to get to tonight or tonight, today, this morning. Do I say tonight a lot? Did I say that already? I don't know. I used to teach it the college group at night and I feel like it's just burning in my head tonight. But Luke 22 we're going to take communion with this and we'll finish up our, our sermon here. Luke 22, and it's a, I mean, all passages, the whole Bible is great, but this is a great passage. Um, this is the, the Lord's Supper, the institution of it. This is before Jesus goes to the cross, right? And uh, so Luke 22, verse 14, it says, And when the hour came, and it's just interesting to note all throughout the gospel accounts, it always talks about... Uh, like Jesus didn't do something or go somewhere because he says not the time hasn't come yet. The hour is not here. And then it's like when the hour came, like it, this is time. It's time to do this thing. He says he reclined at table, right? They're having a meal together. And it says in the apostles with him. So he got the 
apostles, the disciples there. I think it's interesting to note that I believe Judas is at the table. He says that at the end of this, he says, behold, the hand of, the, uh, of him who's going to betray me, he's among you here. Um, and then he's, but he says the apostles with him. And then verse 15, he says, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And this, this word earnestly in some translations is fervent. I fervently desire to eat this Passover with you. Like he, he wants to get together with, with his boys again before he goes and suffers this whole thing. And he wants to get together, not just to have a good time and a meal, like, hey, let's just enjoy this moment. But he gets them together to actually give them some like instructions, some ordinances into what, like, hey, practice this. Because I'm going to be gone, but you guys need to remember this. And so he goes on, verse 16, for I tell you, I will not eat until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And I think that's interesting. Jesus is like, I'm going to fast until all you get here. Isn't that kind of interesting? You see that? I'm going I'm to fast. I'm not going to eat, eat of this supper again until it's all fulfilled in the kingdom of God, till it's all wrapped up, till we're there with him. In verse 17, it says, and he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom comes, kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten of this bread, he said, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And he says, and remember, he says, do this in remembrance of me. Right after that, he says, but behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on this table. But he says, do this in remembrance of me. Take of the bread. It's my body. It's going to be broken for you. It's my, it's my life. It's my, my, the image of my picture, right? Hebrews says that Jesus is this complete picture of God. And he's like, my body is going to be broken for you. Remember what I do for you. And then he says, the cup, the juice, it's my blood that's poured out for you. It's my blood that covers your sins. It's, it's by his blood that we're washed clean, white as, as snow, white as wool, I think one of the scriptures even says, right? And so he says, do this in remembrance of me. And so he's given them instructions before he's betrayed and arrested because it's like it's his last words, right? His, if you got one thing left to say, Jesus, what is it? And he's like, just do this in remembrance of me. Don't forget me. And it's not a thing where it's like a selfish thing where I just hope that my, my legacy lives on, right? Some of us are like, well, just don't forget me. We want to make an impact on the world. Jesus is saying like, this is everything. What I'm going to do for you is going to change everything that you're going to do for me. It's going to change the world. Don't forget this and do it in remembrance of me. Now I know sometimes with communion, we, we have the tendency to think about ourselves. Right? We think about our sins, our shortcomings, our failures. But you need to know that Jesus again said on the cross, it is finished. The sacrifice had been made. The atonement had been made. And all we need to do is say, I, I repent of my sins. You confess them. And that if we confess them, he's faithful and just to forgive us of it. And so... Romans 8, 1 says that there's therefore now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. And so when we come to communion, I mean, for one, if you're living in sin, I think there is the element where you do need to repent of that. Paul says, I think in either 1st or 2nd Corinthians, don't take communion in an unworthy manner. Like if you got sin and you're living a lifestyle of sin, like get right with God before you take this. And if that's you today, get right with God in, in a moment by yourself where you just say, God, forgive me. I, I've messed up. I've blown it. Wash me clean as, as just wash me clean. Make me pure and believe that he will. And that there is therefore now no condemnation because now you're, you're right with Jesus and he's taken that sin upon the cross. And then we remember him again. It's not about us. It's about him, right? He doesn't say, remember your sin. He doesn't say, remember what you did. You're the reason that I'm doing this anyway. He says, just remember me. Remember my body being broken and my blood being spilled for you. And do this in remembrance of me. So now as we'll close, I do want us, if you haven't taken the little cracker out, let's get our communion ready. And, um, and really, I'm just going to kind of pray us through this. If you want to take a moment, you know, and, and you take communion, maybe not right as 
I take communion or we take communion, that's fine. This is between you and the Lord, but it's something that Jesus did call the disciples to do and to come together where they would just say, oh, I remember you, Jesus. Right? How, how often in life we forget about Jesus. I think that's one of the things in this 21 days of prayer and fasting where we realize, man, I didn't realize how much I was on social media that I forgot about Jesus. And this is the moment where we're like, it's all about you. Everything that I have, everything that I do, it's all about you. How can I be an imitator of you, God? I want to live for you. And then we remember that Jesus lived and died for us. And so we got this cracker, again, uh, re resembles the body of Jesus. If you're on Facebook, I'm sorry I forgot to mention this to you. Go grab some bread out of your out of your pantry or wherever you keep your bread. Get some juice. If you don't have any juice, take some water. I don't know, but... Join us in this um, and take communion. But it's the blood, or it's the bread, is the body of Christ broken for us. So when we take it, we're, we're taking it. We're remembering Jesus dying upon the cross. And so I just want to pray, and we can take it. So Father, we we thank you, thank you for sending your Son, Lord. We thank you for Jesus living a perfect life, modeling the way for us, showing us how we can live as children following after you, God. We thank you for Jesus, the obedience that you gave him, the joy for the joy set before him. He endured the cross for us. Lord, we thank you for that sacrifice, the sacrifice. It's once for all. There isn't any other sacrifices that need to be made. There's nothing that we can do. You did it all. Now we just want to respond and remember you. God, and so as we, we come together and we take communion today, Lord, as we end the fast, we do it by taking this, this bread that resembles your body, your life that you laid down for us so that we could live. And so we thank you for this. And we'll take, take up the bread if you want with us. Or take a moment. And Father, we remember not only Jesus' body being broken for us, Lord, but we remember the blood that was spilled, Lord. It's by His blood that we are made pure, Lord. It's the, the ultimate atonement, Lord. It says, without the shedding of blood, Lord, there is no forgiveness of sins, Lord. And it's Your precious blood that was shed on the cross that we remember today that sets us free. That, that really atones for our sins, Lord. And so help us to not forget this, Lord, for in your blood we find life. Lord, and we remember this, we remember you, and we thank you. And we'll take of the juice. So Lord, we, we again thank you for all that you've done and all that you're doing and all that you will do, God. And we want to ask that you would pour out your spirit upon us, Lord. As we consider the text from today, be imitators of God as, as your children. And as we consider walking in love, as you walked in love towards us, God, help us to know what that means. Help us to understand that, Lord. Teach us, Lord. Lord, be our teacher. Be our guidance through life. Give us wisdom. Give us discernment, knowledge, understanding, all the things, Lord, that the that Solomon says in Proverbs, cry out for understanding. Lord, help us to want to understand you more so that we can live as better imitators of you, God. Help us. Help us to not forget why we're doing these things. Help us to not forget why we're alive, why we were created, Lord. You say all things were made by you and for you. So help us to, to live in light of our purpose to remember you and to make you known to others. We thank you for this time, for this day. We thank you for these 21 days of prayer and fasting, Lord. And I pray that it's honestly shaken us up, Lord, stirred something up in us, Lord, to want you more, to know that our physical desires and things we want and even some of the physical things we need like food, Lord, aren't as important as knowing you. So God, help us to stay close to you, Lord, in the days and weeks to come, Lord, and help us to shine bright and help us to, to live fervently so that people may know you. And we ask these things and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.